before. And uh, let's go. Um, thank you everybody for joining and welcome to the uh, Scarborough Housing Alliance's meeting on uh, Wednesday, October 26th. Uh, we'll start with uh, an approval of the meeting minutes. Um, did we start the minutes? We did not. We did not. So the agenda item there. We so. will skip that item um, <clears throat> and move on to the second item on the agenda. Um, we've received uh, an application for uh, for funds that uh, that are sitting in the uh, housing trust funds um, for the three I project at Scarborough Downs, um, and we've each received a uh, an email with a link to a, uh, a Dropbox that has a <clears throat> an application which was very thorough. Well, I appreciate it. it described the project, described the sponsor, um, and the use of funds. Uh, and I'm hopeful that everybody read it and, and hopefully has some questions. But we're fortunate to have the uh, the development team here. And so I, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to talk about your project. Uh, sure. And um, and then like to open up the uh, the floor to the committee to ask any questions. And, sure. um, also, look up the floor to you guys to ask any questions to the committee about the uh, the program. Great. Thanks. So try to be respectful of everyone's time uh, at the one of these committees in the past. and. I know you don't necessarily want to hear the applicant regurgitate everything. So don't, don't read it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just as a general introduction, again, my name is Corey Fellows. I'm with Coral Preservation of Affordable Housing. We are a Boston-based national nonprofit. Uh, we have properties, I think, in <clears throat> 12 states plus D.C. now and close to close to either 11 or 12,000 units um, overall. This would be our first project in Maine. Um, I happen to live here in Scarborough. so. That's very exciting for me on a number of levels. Um, I have something in my own backyard or front yard, depending on how you put it. Um, with me is Peter Sklowski, who's a senior project manager, who's really kind of running point on this project for us. And our partner, uh, our local partner, uh, 3i Housing of Maine. And I guess I'll turn over to Paul so we can talk a little bit about the mission behind this, because Paul is really where this all started. Hi, everyone. Um, so, this has been uh, quite the journey. It's the culmination of uh, really applying uh, lived experiences that a number of us uh, in the greater Portland area have had um, with a, a loved one with a physical disability. Um, and um, when my wife uh, passed in 2016, um, after uh, living with a neurodegenerative disease, um, I retired soon thereafter from L.L. Bean and said, you know, there, this, Susan's life was shorter than we would have liked, but it was full. And it was full because we were in a position where we could um, manage her environment and give her the opportunity to really um, control the way that she lived and how she participated in the community. And uh, when we um, stepped back and recognized that um, folks who did not have with the same level, I would say, of, uh, of support um, and were younger, were, were oftentimes in, in Maine and elsewhere uh, relegated <clears throat> to life in a nursing home. And um, in the pandemic, uh, we found out that that was really anathema to the uh, to the notion of uh, self-determination. So I started making the rounds and the first uh, place I went was Boston and a Kresge Foundation uh, meeting um, where I was the sole representative, uh, an emissary without portfolio, but it was all representatives from, from New England. Um, it, and, and I was in from Maine. And when I saw that, you know, Stable supportive housing can be a so is a social determinant of health. I um, started, you know, digging in deeper and found a model in Canada. Met with the state and the Office of Aging and Disability Services. Uh, formed the nonprofit two and a half years ago, three years <clears throat> ago, and a year ago, uh, our idea came from. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, became more than an idea because that's when we established this working relationship with uh, POA and the uh, uh, the formidable uh, experience that they bring to bear to uh, a low-income housing tax credit development, which uh, this is. So 
Um, our focus is really on the three eyes, independent living through innovative technology in an integrated home and community-based uh, setting. Um, so we're very excited about the prospects for being involved in the Scarborough uh, project here at the Downs. And um, I'm here to be, uh, be a voice um, for our community, um, which is now sort of uh, getting the buzz. You know, we're getting inquiries. Um, happy to answer questions, but I really want to uh, like turn it back over to uh, Vita and uh, Corey for um, for further amplification about what you know we're looking to do with as uh, this opportunity with the alliance presents itself. <laughs> Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about sort of where we are with the project overall? Yeah, and... sure. Um, so we started working in earnest with Paul about a year ago. Um, we came up with a program, an idea of partnering with the Downs around the same time. I think it was last winter, so maybe just earlier than that. So um, we have signed a PNS agreement with uh, Crossroads or MNR, which is the owner of the, the uh, entire Scarborough Downs, back earlier this spring. Um, the idea is that we would seek subsidies from the state um, and the city here as well, and the other local housing kind of tax credit um, and other local housing subsidies to create 51 apartments, all of which would be um, for households or earning at or below 60% of area median income, all of which would be um, local housing tax credit um, units, all of which would be. Um, or households where at least one person or adult has a physical or mobile disability. Um, there's information in the application. Basically, you know, where we are in the project is that we have submitted four funds for low income housing tax credits through a 4% life tax walk in program with main housing. We submitted that um, pre application on a couple of weeks ago. Um, in as that program relates to projects that form project labor agreements, essentially working with uh, the trades to make sure that we are going to be abiding by certain rates and certain rules of uh, the trade in Maine. Um, where we are out with the project, we've uh, advanced our schematic design. We've selected a whole design team. So we have uh, a landscape architect on board, our architect based in Boston on board. Um, so we have kind of landscape and uh, building interior schematic drawings. Um, we are planning to kind of ride the wave of Crossroads GMO exemption approval, um, which happened a couple weeks ago. They're planning their process of submitting their master plan and subdivision to the town of Scarborough. I don't know how much you know about that, but anyway, we're kind of working in tandem with them very closely because as they submit their master plan and, and subdivision approvals, uh, for approval by the town, we're going to be submitting that as well in the spring. So they're going to be, now that they have that um, GMO exemption approved, they're going to be submitting that in the next couple of months between January and I think April or so. They'll be <coughs> going through approvals uh, with meetings with the town. We'll be right behind them, essentially between February and uh, May, getting those approvals. Um, we're hoping that we hear back from main housing on the pre app soon. Um, we'll be submitting a full application just because we just submitted a pre-application um, just recently. And so we're hoping that we hear back from main housing on the funding award also next spring or so as we go through our um, master plan, site plan approval. And um, if all goes well, we could close on construction financing and begin construction next fall. That's kind of our optimistic um, approach, us being <coughs> over dollars. So that's the current plan. We are expecting that the construction period to take maybe 12, 14 months. And so um, when all said and done, if we start construction next fall, winter, then we could open in early 2025, again, without optimistic um, We, thanks to Paul and his kind of reputation and his uh, great work, um, we've been in the press. Which has, um, which has been in, I think, the local Portland press mm -hmm. and something called Scarborough. Like Scarborough Leader. Uh, oh. The Leader, yeah, yeah. So Paul's been in the press a lot, which has been great for our project, great for exposure, great for um, 
main housing to also know what we are, what we're doing, what we're trying to uh, solve for. And also for um, starting to leave. We haven't actually gotten actual applications for housing, but we've gone way over a dozen, if not two dozen, um, inquiries mm -hmm. to um, for housing for folks who have disabilities, whether it's their sister or if they know someone or it's them themselves who's reaching out and saying, oh, I heard about this housing project that Paul Annette is going to be building. Um, when can I move in? You know, when, mm -hmm. how do I apply? Please tell me more. So we've been kind of keeping track of that. Um, and it's a, it's a, you know, the growing and building, providing home for these folks that really need home. So what one add on is of the 51 units, the entire building will be exceed ADA requirements and will be totally accessible. And we yeah. expect to have some innovative uh, technology that would really uh, reduce the need for direct care workers that oftentimes are so, uh, critical to maintaining the independence for individuals. So this is almost a cutting edge kind of uh, play and we're getting um, just having discussions with some um, significant uh, entrepreneurial interests who like what we have uh, to offer in that regard. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a community component to that because if you can imagine someone who relies upon a wheelchair for uh, mobility, if that wheelchair breaks and that individual is waiting for the insurance company, you know, approve uh, retrofitting, then, you know, in, in essence, you know, you're isolating that individual even further. Well, we've seen ways in other locations where a, a 3D printer can be used to actually retrofit uh, almost immediately and, and uh, rig up something in a, in a workspace. And so part of the building is potentially to be set aside for that use not only for our residents, but also for the community at large. You might make a couple more things. So one yeah. is we're um sorry, we're we're making sure that every single unit is not only ADA above ADA accessibility um compliant, but also ANSI 2017, which is a more rigorous kind of standard for facility design. Um Paul's been generous enough to provide a consultant on board who knows kind of the ins and outs of unit layouts for um folks with disabilities that really can help okay, what size should our doorway be? How should the radius work inside the bathroom between the bathroom and the bedroom and all, all that kind of mm -hmm. um all that kind of thinking? And then we've also gone to a couple properties in Boston, in Dorchester and in Chelsea to see how to really think about the design of this building so, so that it works for the folks who are trying to live there independently and not rely on an assistant or some kind of CNA or some kind of other person to fix the the daily life. So I wonder if I'm um, <clears throat> looking at the income in the application mm -hmm. and uh, it, this is a, you know, what probably wildly or this is, I think this sounds wildly ignorant, but can you just describe the, 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 uh, the realism of the population uh, income wise and job wise and uh, you know, what is it like to be someone who you're serving um, and, and uh, the context for my question is, you know, my experience uh, in, in section eight and um <clears throat> so when i when i look at the rents that are that are here and when i when i hear that all of the units will be occupied by somebody with some physical disability um and i look at the one bedrooms uh, I, I think wow how is how is somebody in a one bedroom gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna swing it how are they gonna pay yeah, whatever 1200 bucks a month but that is affordable then i get that but it sounds like a lot of money um, and so where does, how, do, how does that all work? And, and like, what, what is your customer base really like in real life? Can you talk about that? Well, um, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, um, I can tell you that the cost burden to um, an individual who um, is above, well, who, who has, needs with activities of daily living um, and you know is earning income only based upon social security disability income <laughs> you're right there, there's, there's a big gap there and so we um, are working with the state because 
there is a bias towards institutional care. Mm -hmm. And that has been in the uh, a matter of public policy since the 70s. But the state is redesigning their um, residential care model because um, I don't have the numbers uh, down pat, but on average, it costs the state to provide room and board under main care $80,000 a year. So if you're looking at a person, a real life person, uh, who lives, uh, who, who called us up and said, hey, I'm 27 years old, I was in a horrific car accident. Um, I'm in a wheelchair. I also uh, have no place to live. Um, I don't want to live in a nursing home for the next X number of years. So, so the state now is open to innovative ideas and they're, they're, they're on a task force to try to see how we can shift some of the, these monies because we think that um, actually studies have shown um, elsewhere that you can improve the quality of life and you can reduce the overall expenditures for the healthcare system because people will be more inclined to uh, to our service model to avoid um, needless emergency room visits mm. and that are a burden or hospitalizations in the like. So there, we, we expect to be able to leverage some public side of things, but uh, at the same time, I understand the the the, the, um, the the question, and I know about Section Eight, but I'm not <laughs> so I'm going to have to. Well, yeah, and, and, you know, not to, not to ask if it's you know, that involved, but I mean, the I guess the, the core of the question is: Does is this, or do you anticipate that there would be some sort of uh, yeah, innovative you know, rental subsidy you know, that might involve the healthcare system in order to, to be able to house people who both qualify income-wise uh, and also have the qualifying disability. I, I think with this, this one, one, one area that I think we also have some philanthropic uh, ideas uh, in mind, but um, it, it's, it's a legitimate question. I, that's, that's, definitely one, that's definitely one prong of it, and I would just add as well that I mean, part of this whole <laughs> concept is you know sort of emphasizing both the independent and the integrated eyes of three eye. Um, in some, in a, in a sense, we, we're thinking about this as workforce housing. Um, with these, I, and, and I think it's sometimes there, there's a tendency, understandably, to when you when you're thinking about people, you know, disabled people living in a building that's designed for disabled people, that they may not be working or they may have trouble generating income. And it's a valid, it's a valid concern. Um, but I think you know part of what we've always thought about since Paul came to us with this opportunity, and we really looked at this site. And part of what excited us about this site is that um, it's 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 in a it's in a great location for people to be able to access not only services and healthcare but employment as well, and there'll be public transportation. Um, and so we we really. We're really excited about that aspect of it. That this this will enable people, hopefully, to to continue working, um, as, you know, for as long as they can, and not and not have their physical disability be a, um, a deterrent to that. So yeah, I, I, you know, I appreciate um, Corey jumping in there because um, that was one of the things when I heard about the uh, when we first started talking to uh, the Crossroads and we saw some of the. You know, um, Mixed use that was happening uh, happening there, and then I had a conversation again with this, this gentleman. Who lives on Peaks Island, couch surfing, and he was in the in the car accident, and he had to take the ferry to his job and um, someplace on the mainland, I was in, you know, contiguous to Scarborough, and he said, "I can't find an acceptable place to live." And I hold it. I went to went to school after I went through the rehab business. So. You know, I've got a job and you know, I'm, like, I'm ready. I need it. So we think that we're going to be oversubscribed. Mm. We think that the statistics in the market studies that, that is that 18% of Mainers between the ages of 18 and 64 have a disability. And, uh, and we're in a population here where we think it's, uh, it's not Boston where our uh, top, if you will, was 36 units of accessible housing in the 2000 applicant sheet. Mm -hmm. But at 51, we think we're going to be able to you know, 
get that number. Yeah, and you can't tell if all of those 2,000 applicants were actually income qualified or could yeah. be qualified. But we do have a market study that we actually just received a uh, revision of today saying that, you know, the rents that we are citing are, are achievable and reasonable. And, you know, also to speak to the fact that those inquiries that have been coming in, again, we haven't qualified them, we haven't gotten applications from them, but there certainly is, you know, visible need for folks just reading the article and saying, Okay. And then my last two questions before we start opening up. <clears throat> um, one, uh, understanding that your mission has to do with full accessibility and for identability and design for accessible and full service of accessibility. Um, do you intend to officially commit to like main housing and, and other funders to be fully accessible in some way, or will you maintain some flexibility just in case? Um, you need that flexibility. Um, and, um, well, you know, there's uh, I don't know, maybe it's a practice, maybe it's a habit, I don't know, of um, under promising and over delivering, right? So, like, if you, you know, maybe with some things in these applications, you might um, promise 10% of flexibility but deliver 100%. Um, and so, my question is, are you planning to promise the main housing that 100% of these units will be filled with people with a physical disability or promise something less and hope for something more? Um, mm -hmm. And then the second question is just for the committee's sake, um, how much money are you asking for from us? Just to kind of formalize that. Um, do you want to talk about the tenant collection then or do you want to Sure, yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about the, about the first question. So, um, you know, we're in the process of, as, as Vita mentioned, we have a free app in to main housing. There have been, Paul and others have had conversations with various folks at main housing and elsewhere at the state about, about this concept conceptually. Um, but we're just now starting to dig in and like, you know, begin real conversations, more formal discussions about the project. And we knew going in that, you know, that this project doesn't fit neatly within their sort of standard mocks. Um, so we're going to be having conversations with them about not only what's being, you know, what's being promised. I would, I will say, um, we're probably, probably, we're probably more inclined to lean more toward the former scenario of, of saying, promising that these are going to be fully accessible because that is such a bedrock of the, of the, of the concept and of, of the project. And fully used, or right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and you know, the one of the first questions we had when we when, when this opportunity first came up was, well, are we going to are we going to be able to marry that concept with the, the realities of tenant selection plan requirements within low income housing and all the you know the fair finances housing with fair housing laws? We do think that there there is some precedent, um, including in in Maine and in Portland for that. Um, uh, and but we we think that they're we anticipate having conversations with main housing about that when we really sit down with them to kind of talk about it. you know this is this is what we intend to do this is this is how we want to define the, the resident eligibility criteria mm -hmm. and our hope is that we can get them comfortable with that. Uh, it will help. unlike other low income uh, housing projects that I've been introduced to in my short. Time in this realm, there will be no um, age restriction. Right. So, um, you know, there will be an opportunity for someone to, you know, really age in place. And um, that, um, you know, is, is also a hallmark of, of what this is because, you know, there are 61 million Americans with a disability. And it's a large minority. Um, that any one of us tomorrow could uh, become a part. You slip on the ice and look what happens. Mm -hmm. Look what happens to you. So there just isn't enough housing to meet the need. And so yes, we you know we think that we can make it. Um, you know, when we speak to uh, main housing, um, my impression is that they, along with their counterparts at DHHS, have access to real numbers. Some of the numbers that we have are anecdotal and they're drawn from uh, census bureau <clears throat> stats and statistics, but the state has access to a, a lot more detail. 
particularly in you know in Cumberland County, Northern York County. And uh, we're looking forward to meeting with them. Okay. And then we ask, how much I buried exporting? the lead, right? Yes. Um, I put on yes. the last page of the pro forma, two hundred thousand dollars. Great. Yeah. Brian, you you you're citing uh, probable rents. Where where is that information? Yeah. So in the um, on the Dropbox piece, it's on the pro forma page, yeah. and it's on page three of fourteen. Um, yeah, so it, it looks from here that all of the units are planned to be for people at 60% uh, of oh, area median yeah. income or lower. Um, and <laughs> one bedroom runs at 1220, two is at 1460, and three is at 1680. Mm -hmm. um, and the 60% AMI, is that a function of the particular program that you're applying for? Or is that uh, the threshold that you've chosen for yourself? That's how the loan to housing tax credit works. So you have, um, you get credits for units that are targeted at that in one level. Or up to. Unless you do income out. There is a, <laughs> Brian and I are laughing because I was just on a panel talking about this wrinkle uh, last week in Boston at a housing conference. There is a, a variation. Um, there's an option within the tax credit program, which is relatively new. That, as far as we know, main housing is not done, and they don't seem to have a great appetite for. But it's called the average income test, and rather than having all of your units be at or below 60% of area median income, you can have uh, you can have units up to 80% of area median as long as your overall average still stays below 60. Um, we have talked about that, I've asked about it a little bit, thinking about this project. Um, uh, we'll probably put it on the table when we sit down and talk to Main Housing, but as far as we know, um, Main Housing hasn't done it and they, they don't, from, from, from what I've heard anecdotally, mm -hmm. and I know there are others there are here, folks here who may have more familiarity with, with, with the agency than I do at this point actually, but um, I don't think they have a, a strong appetite to do it. It does have complexity. There's yeah. added compliance risk yeah. and um, just more moving parts. Um, I'll mention to you guys that 80% uh, of AMI uh, would qualify as affordable within the town of Skyway. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, just there's a data point for mm -hmm. so that's good. Um, speaking of the uh, sort of nuances of the tax credit program, one update since we submitted the this application to the alliance is that we um, became aware that the site is actually in a QCT, a qualified census tract slash well, DDA, difficult to develop area, which was a change that was made as of 2022 that we were not aware of when we were putting these numbers together. So what that does is it, it creates a 30% tax credit basis boost, um, which, um, which definitely helps certainly does not diminish our need for additional uh, support. Yes. Um, but it definitely helps. Indeed, it could speak to the specifics of that. If there are more it questions. More questions. Yeah. Uh, how far in the weeds you want to get? I'm curious, what was the cause of that change or that, uh, that distinction in 2022, you said? 2022. So um, every year, HUD updates these boundaries and designations. They're typically, um, you typically see them in lower income areas in cities um, mm -hmm. and other places where incomes are lower, but sometimes they are used like on, we've had quite a bit of experience as an organization on Cape Cod where a lot of the Cape was considered a quote unquote DBA, even though, uh, and, and, and the, the rationale for it really is more about cost and, uh, and affordability. Um, and uh, I believe there is some local or state involvement or input into how those designations are made. Um, but I was, it, it hadn't frankly occurred to me that <laughs> that, that the site would, would fall within that. Um, so. And you said the benefit a, of the project is uh, you mentioned thirty percent. So you you get essentially a um, there's a portion of the project total development cost that's no with, within the tax credit program as eligible basis, and so typically you you, know, you you multiply that by whatever type of tax credit whatever the tax credit percentage is for the tax credit program 
you're utilizing, which in this case will be 4%. And then you multiply that by 2% ownership. And then you multiply that by whatever your investor is paying for credit. And that ends up being your tax credit equity yield. So with the, when you have a when you have uh, one of these designations, either a QCT or DDA, you take that first figure, that eligible basis, that portion of your development cost, which is mostly your construction costs, but some some other costs as well, and you multiply that by 130 percent. So you get a 30 percent boost on that, and then everything else sort of on top, stacked on top of that. Mm -hmm. So is that the roughly 17 million? Um, that's the construction cost alone. So, right? so it would be it would be thirty percent of that seven point two million dollars of equity. Yeah, right. And then right. it looks like there's this huge gap that. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it that way. I would more than the way you say. Yeah. So we take all the costs that are eligible to yeah. construction and other things like soft costs, and then we're boosting that times one hundred thirty percent. Yeah. And then on top of that, we're using that cost instead of just one hundred percent to multiply it for our um, equity yield. Yeah, and, and I'm seeing here, like, there's this huge, like, $3.6 million gap that I mean, doesn't right. look like Are you here for the housing right. alliance meeting? Right. So, are you here for the housing alliance so meeting? That helps the offset. It helps the offset. Yeah. 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 It doesn't fully offset right. it, which, uh, so, correct. That makes sense. So, with that boost, we would get more yeah. equity, yeah. which would reduce our gap. Wait, but we still have still a gap. Gonna, but we would still have a gap. You still got a gap, which yeah. this helps to. Right, correct. So. So we try to understand this right and kind of innocent to this. So that's the tax, tax credit that goes to the investors. Right. So basically the, the the credit, the tax credit itself goes to goes to investors, which are typically banks and right. insurance companies and right. funds. But then they they pay they pay cash. They they provide cash that goes into the project and, and supports the development. Mm -hmm. um, and the credit, the actual credits are allocated by the state. Allocating agency, which in this case is main housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, your hmm? I, your <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't mean to pull us into the weeds, but no, I thought it no, was important, 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 important clarification. Yeah, and, and, and so, just my my last last question before I open it up. You kind of you came in with like this three point six million dollar problem that we're like two hundred thousand dollars of the solution right. to. Um, now you still have like a problem, which like that's why you guys do work. Um, but <laughs> and we're still <laughs> part of the solution. Yeah. There's still, exactly. pro there's still a problem. There's still a problem. Yes, we still are. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That makes sense. Any other questions? <laughs> Nick, no. What do you think? <laughs> I'm kind of late to our meeting, but uh, um, okay. uh, Brian, it's G Marie. <laughs> um. I hate to be a pest, but I know I can't I couldn't find the link for the drop box, but you can take care of that later. Yeah, you know what? Um I will take care of it later. I will take care of it now. I will okay. send you a copy of it. And uh it's actually on the agenda here, Marie. Well, I pulled that don't ask. I'm having all sorts of issues okay. today. <laughs> it's probably me. Anyway, I'll anyway, uh and, and this is for Tom. And I may be jumping way ahead. Uh, I had a discussion with Mr. Mr. Clucci today, who's down in Aruba, God love him. Um, and he mentioned something about who gets the affordable money and the developers. And Tom, do you know what I'm talking about? I do. I do. And and it's fees and there's a, maybe a hiccup there. Yeah, it's, a, it's an issue that the, the Alliance should talk about whether this project is even eligible. And, and I say that because the, the funds that we're drawing from, uh, the council's defined in its zoning ordinance, the allowable uses. And there is an exclusion for projects that are located in a development that, that requires, as a matter of right or requirement, some level of affordable housing. Oh, okay. Um, and in this case, the, it's an inclusionary zone, which is 10% affordable housing requirement overall in the towns. Um, I've given some thought to this. I, I, I might suggest we kind of put a pin in that discussion. I think it's important yep. for us to understand the project uh, since we have the applicants here. Uh, but I do have some thoughts about that, Jim Ray. Okay, great. I And I, again, I'm fine waiting on that. It's just, I, I was like, yeah, okay. So we need to deal with that. All right. 
Thank you. I'm curious, is this a new um, a new program through Main Street Housing? Is this the one that you're applying? Yeah, yeah. And you it, it, it did open up very recently. Just in September. Is this the one that closed because of interest? Mm -hmm. There was one that there was a previous 4% round, 4% that they call it walk in round that closed very quickly over the summer. In July. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we weren't quite ready. We were all about this event, and then we, anyway, we kind of missed the boat. Um, and then this round opened up with the public labor agreement um, condition. And so we applied for that back in September. And, and you made pre applications. So, so does that secure your standing, so to speak? Good question. Um, yeah, we think so. It, yes or yeah. no? It, it, it secures our place in the, in the queue okay. um, with the understanding that main housing has to review the pre application, the pre -application. and then invite us to formally. Put, put, put in the full application. So sure. it's kind of a, we both need each other to secure the spot. And the, the, uh, the project labor agreement, Corey, you, you and I have talked about this mm -hmm. briefly, and it sounds like main housing is still trying to sort through it themselves. They uh, are. Does that, that mean anything to us, or that, that's really just an issue that you have to worry it's about? really more an issue for us, us and our GC, yeah. yeah, and ourselves. And that's to make sure that certain prevailing rates are being paid to. Essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say the jury is still out on what that, that impact will be on project cost. Um, we, you know, we're working with Landry French as our precon, our GC for at least precon now. Mm -hmm. And um, we think that that the numbers that we have, which are that are which are baked into this application, are fairly conservative, and we don't expect there to be a significant premium for the for the project labor agreement. That said, we haven't yet seen the wage sheet. That, that whole process is underway right now. We've had kind of in parallel with, with our engagement with Maine Housing, we've had communication with the building trades representative uh, along with Landry French, and we'll be, we should be getting our a better handle on what those costs will look like fairly soon. But that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's for us to sort of figure out. And I do note in your application, there's also a that's almost a passing reference to a, uh, a credit enhancement agreement that, that the project will be seeking as well. I, I think it's important for the alliance to want to be aware of it, and I might suggest that we that the two matters kind of move forward in tandem. Uh, I think it, it, it makes sense for that. So, I, I don't know how to how you'd like to handle those two pieces. They're certainly related, but they're independent. Yeah, I, I know in the past uh, with projects, uh, we've the way we've handled it, yeah, we uh, have projects that we've approved funding for, and we've also, um, for those same projects, you know, written letters of support and expressed support to the council, encouraging them to you know, approve the uh, credit enhancement agreements. Um, and they <clears throat> stood, you know, stood side by side. Um, our role with all of this is completely advisory. It's town council that makes all the decisions. Um, I think we make, you know, our advice is stronger on the, the allocation of funds, I think. Um, but uh, you know, we certainly have a voice and we're, we're seeing as the advisor related to housing issues. So. I do have a question on the CEA and I, I, I don't want to divert, but um, you're you're seeking 25%, is that correct? That's our, that's been our assumption. So I, I presume that past experience, the, the rationale of the, I guess the winning argument, if you will, for credit enhancement agreements for affordable projects really have to do with um, more than the bottom line, it has to do with uh, getting additional points in the competitive system. So my recollection of the current QAP, 25% doesn't get you any points. So this must be all about lower market capital as opposed to I would say it's probably it is primarily about project economics, absolutely. And since we're this we're playing this as a 4% execution. We won't really be competing for points anyway, or that we were in a 9% scenario. But having said that, based, certainly based on our experience in Massachusetts and other places, I, I would imagine in Maine is the case as well to an extent, um, the state agency still looks more favorably on projects where there's more local investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, both as an indication of, of <coughs> genuine <coughs> as well as just you know for additional leveraging purposes so 
Yeah, I, yes. so I just mentioned it in, in passing that the, the town council has really come to understand and I think appreciate the value of points in that competitive system. So mm -hmm. I think one of the also challenges in this one is to really help us understand kind of the bottom line economics and why that is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, that's a conversation we can have. At, at the okay. Yeah, and we we had sort of held yeah. off, and I think I might have mentioned this to you at some point, Tom. We had sort of held off on initiating anything on the CEA front until. The GMO matter was resolved. It sort of felt like it might be premature. Um, and we also didn't want to just distract the council. Um, so um, I know we're about to have elections as well, but we'll definitely plan to engage on that. Good. Tom, what's the level required for points generally? Is it a 50%? CAA? It varies, as I recall, 50% may have, I think it changes with the different. Uh, QAP program, but um, as I recall, 75% get the maximum of three points. 50% mm -hmm. um, was two points, perhaps. But, uh, yeah, I'm working off memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that should hopefully be irrelevant to the project because yeah. you're going for the four percent right. program. Yeah, right. yeah. So that might that might be nice to point out, right? right. The, the, yeah, here's right. yeah, what would normally be asked. Uh, here's what right. that would cost, and here's what we're actually asking with, with the points that we get now. Right. That's helpful. Thank you. I was looking at the preliminary schedule. Um, there's a reference, two references to Town Scarborough zoning submission. Is that is that really planning? Probably planning. Yeah. Sorry, we're connected to the window. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to make sure that there wasn't any. Uh, no. As far as I'm aware, what you're proposing is a matter of right to the zone. Right. 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 So, exactly. yeah. so what V was referring to earlier for early next year is, is site plan approval, site plan approval, get approval with the planning board. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Corey, with, with the um, project labor agreements, one of the things that I think I heard, although maybe I just made it up in my mind, um, I think I do that sometimes, is uh, that that might encourage more local labor. And more local labor participation. Um, is that are, are you hearing that from my designs? Yeah, you know, just... honestly, have not. Uh, in fact, you know, there there's some question, and you know, as, as Tom alluded to, they're they're really kind of, and they very openly kind of figuring this out as they go along. They during the introductory call we had, they used the you know building the bicycle as we're going down the hill metaphor. Oh, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> so I think there's there's some opportunity. There's some the airplane. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen that There can be some opportunity in that, yeah. but um, it means that you know it's sort of uncharted territory. This is a new. This is the first time main housing has done this, and it's kind of an interesting mix of mm. of, of people and organizations. Um, there's some question as to um, Frankly, how much interest there's going to be in the subcontractor community and in the, in the labor community oh, in this sure. current economic environment when there's already so much work. Huh. Um, but we, you know, we've had some candid conversations with with the the, uh, the building trades people about that, and it sounds like they're trying to build in as much flexibility as possible. Yeah. Um, but I will honestly be we'll be getting a handle on that. We'll be learning that as we go. And, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have one last question? Yeah, I just want to make sure we. Yeah. Uh, on the preliminary performa in the application, uh, if I'm reading this right, um, you're looking at about four hundred and forty-four thousand dollars per unit. All in. And I mentioned that um, does main housing have a limit cost per unit? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Um, they they have guiding principles around how much they want to provide in terms of their four percent tax exempt bond and their uh, allocation. However, they do recognize, and we've spoken to our consultant uh, about this and to them uh, directly. They recognize the the world we're living in in terms of production costs, and everyone is really this is not a unique project to us, a uh, unique, unique situation to us that we are facing. You know cost um, increases so, to speak. so they are aware that their guidance principles are lower than everybody can afford really for their uh by the is, is part of that too because it's handicap housing 
just some additional cost for that? Um, I guess. Yeah. yeah, because a typical unit would be smaller than the ones that we're proposing. So there's just more square feet. And there's also, you know, more common area being the hallways a little bit wider and the ground floor lower proposing program to be a little bit wider. So we're larger to accommodate, you know, services for these folks and property management offices and um, you know, the mobile hub for wheelchair um, repairs, that kind of thing. So it's a larger than usual building. Yeah, I was just asking, I, I wasn't wasn't sure if main housing had a hard and fast rule or I want to make sure that you weren't exceeding that. We've <clears throat> been very mindful of these uh parameters yeah. and been trying to make the best of them and you know work with them. I'll mention as well that we have a um I think it's included in, in the in the numbers, the, the legislative earmark. Yeah. For no the, the congressional designation. Right. Um I put that out on both sides because right. it would basically be work that we would be doing for this technology right. as a use of funds and also a source of funds. So in essence, it was a wash. So I just took it out. Yeah. But it's an example of how, right. I mean, we've, yeah. we've been pursuing resources at multiple levels for different things, including um, supporting residents, um, helping to helping to fund what in some, in a sense, will be kind of pilot technology. Uh, so we do have a um, both Senators King and, and Collins um, supported a, a, a congressional earmark request of $500,000 to help fund that. And it is with appropriations now, of course, who knows what will happen with that now. <laughs> but um, so at this point, it probably won't move until sometime next year. But it is something that we're, we're tracking. Bill, any any questions or comments? No, I, I, I'm Eric. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair looks great, Eric. <laughs> I'd like I'd like to ask an intelligent question, but I can't think of one. <laughs> oh. How about the other Eric? <laughs> I was just I was just thinking, wow, he really is Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm all set. Thanks. Great. And Jane Marie, any any other comments or questions? Um, my only comment is, you know, you guys know I have this deep dark past that I bring up occasionally, and I uh, work for. Uh, voc rehab years ago as a uh, job developer um, with corporations. Um, and when you talked about these folks being able to be in the workforce and encouraging that, I'm like all thumbs up on that. I think this is an awesome project. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm, I will work my butt off to make sure we get this approved and get the money we need. You just need to understand that because um, just because of my, <clears throat> excuse me, past work with folks with disabling conditions, but also, you know, I, I have friends and family members um, who could have benefited from this. So hats off to you guys for doing this. Um, and yeah, let's get it done. Yeah, thanks. thanks. I'm just curious, maybe you can't answer this, but uh, with some of the units, um, being two and three bedroom, you anticipate families, presumably. Um, I don't know what the product uh, the, the mix is. I think it's heavily uh, tilted towards one, two, 31, one, 31, bedroom, one bedroom. 16 twos, and, and four, four threes. threes. Would you anticipate any school kids? Quite likely. Uh, I, I think that we have to see what the applicants look like and, and yeah. go through the process but it would be anything to preclude i don't anticipate a lot of school kids but uh, it's i assume the the larger units are obviously intended for larger yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 could could be an interesting way for people to actually have the, the structures they need to live in who, who might already live in town um but, but just are kind of mis uh, mishoused if you will um, so it's a pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's good. This really could be a landmark project. It's really exciting. Well, I, I, I have to, you know, 
thank you for the time and the, the thoughtfulness of the questions. And uh, I just, I would just close by saying, you know, we uh, we feel very fortunate to uh, be partnering with an experienced group that uh, knows um, the intricacies of a very delicate dance. And when you're trying to marry up, you know, the vagaries and vicissitudes of public policy with housing, between housing and and services components, one by themselves is complex, but mm -hmm. putting them together is really novel. Um, but there is a movement of, um, going on where we're going to be seeing more and more of this, and we've already been approached by other communities who have seen um, what we planned for Scarborough, and they said, you know, how how might we replicate that? And uh, we want to we want to really focus on what we have in front of us. It's taken us a while to get here, um, and we want to we want to knock it out of the park. So, thank you very much for yeah, your time yeah. and, and yeah. excellent presentation of the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, um, with with the presentation that we just had, what we would normally do is, um, you know, someone would make a motion to, uh, I don't know, uh, recommend the the funding as requested to the town council. Um, and one of us would then write something nice to the town council in support of this, uh, and then the town council would take it off at one of their future meetings. Um, and so uh, if someone would like to make a motion like that, that would be lovely. And somebody can second it, talk about it. Mr. Chairman, I, I think it would behoove the committee to have some conversation around the sorts of funds and the, uh, the uh, I guess the eligibility of this application in the first place. I expect it will be an issue for the council and, and to the extent the Alliance has an opinion on that matter, that might be helpful to include as part of the commentary to them. Yeah, and from what uh, Mr. Clucci said to me today, um, I want to be able to have a very strong argument for the council. And it sounds like there's some holes here that could be, um, I hate to use the word political, but it could get political. And it's like, oh, so, you know, you're giving the money to the downs, you know, the whole nine yards with that. So uh, that's why I wanted to have Mr. Hall talk a bit about it, if he can, if it's appropriate at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so I mean, so to the, to the extent that it's uh, not a, a strictly technical issue, Tom, um, then, I, yeah, then I agree. Um, let's, let's iron that out. Um, if, yeah, I, I if, don't if, know if we can resolve it. But yeah, if it, 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 if it is strictly a technical issue, you know, my preference would be to get, endorse the application and then let right. the council deal with the technical issue but subject to yeah but if it's uh but if it's something that we could weigh in on and and help advance then um uh, let's say let's let's go for that yeah i i wouldn't characterize this as technical i think okay. it does require some it's nuanced and, and perhaps some interpretation frankly okay. so just the the quick background for maybe some of the newer committee members uh the the source of funds that that sit in back of this grant program um are probably 10 years old and the, the council created uh, an affordable housing initiative fund. Um, the funds that, that funnel into that reserve fund come from a variety of sources. Um, the majority of those monies have actually been negotiated through contract zone agreements. Uh, there's two notable ones that come to mind, the Beacon Apartments here on Heights Parkway, and then more recently, Piper Shores. I think those two projects alone were $750,000 toward this fund. Uh, the real challenge we have is that um, rooted in our zoning ordinance, um, a way for residential density to be increased is to provide affordable housing. And there's an in lieu payment that you could choose to do rather than actually providing the affordable unit. Um, so those in lieu payments and that language is kind of consistent through all of this um, also go to this fund. As I said, I would say 10% of the money over time has come through by, by virtue of that, that method, if you will. Um, but <coughs> included in the zoning ordinance is a very clear delineation as to what these funds can be used for. 
And the one that causes me just some pause is the last one, and, and I'll read it. It says the increase collected by the town shall not be utilized to fund affordable housing portions of the development, which are otherwise required to include affordable housing in order to meet minimum zoning standards. The only zone in our town that requires affordable housing is, in fact, the zone that these folks are looking at, the crossroads from the district. So, and that, that's a 10%. 10% of the housing down needs to be. And as a practical matter, they're you know, at this point in time about 20%. They're ahead of schedule. But that measurement is uh, really needs to be taken at the end. So it's always going to be kind of up and down, but they need at the end to be at least 10% of the Yeah. So right. I think that's an interesting point that there's so far they're tracking very positively. Um, and again, to me, the, the strongest argument here is that the vast majority of these funds and and perhaps if the alliance wished, it could actually mention in its recommendation uh, which source of funds that it intends to grant in this case, right for sure, or from another specific project. So I, I think there's an opportunity, um, but I think there's also going to be some questions for the council, you know, can we do this? Mm -hmm. Not just should we, but can we? Yeah. What's that general fund account? It's different accounts from. No, it's a, it's a separate dedicated reserve account. The, the, the real issue is the council, a past council, <clears> defined <throat> for itself, and that definition still stands, what the eligible uses of those funds are. And, and so, Tom, it, it sounds like once upon a time there was an affordable housing initiative fund that everybody thought was going to be funded by in new piece. And that was nice. And a set of rules got made up. Mm -hmm. um, and then somebody decided they wanted to build something. At Piper Shores at the Beacon. Mm -hmm. And one nice thing that they decided to do was pay a bunch of money to the town for affordable housing. Okay. And, and we already had <clears throat> this fund, which nobody thought about. Right. And they just dumped the money. Yeah, it's cool. In, in this. Uh, right. We, we could. So it wasn't in Luffy. It, it was normally money to be set up as a. Right. And that's kind of now it feels. Now it is like the risk that that money, which isn't the same kind of money, was tainted. By being in the same bucket, but um, I think we would say maybe that it's not changing. It's different. Ones. Yeah, I think there's a way to articulate and to differentiate between the different sources of funds. Uh, unfortunately, they, they're commingled and they sit in the same fund now, and the source is distinctly different. And that will resonate with council. Many of them were part of those negotiations and know full well the affordable housing monies that were negotiated as yeah. part of those contract zone sources. Or I think if you do it through any of those, you would probably lean towards the important part of the shores, which does the population that these folks are looking to. Yeah, sure. and that's the most recent one. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that's because they're trying to keep people out of <laughs> the homes and put them yeah. in their own homes. That's kind of like, yeah. uh, I think that would be the most it's kind of like the offsite, the offsite housing for the shores. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying it's a. Uh, it's fatal to this, but it's an issue that we can't ignore. And I think I just raise it at this level because I, the council is certainly going to consider it. So to the extent that you want to weigh in and provide some rationale or an argument for them to consider, um, you know, that, that could be part of your recommendation. So maybe in our next meeting, we have a, a well-crafted motion that addresses that? Yeah, it doesn't sound, based on their project timeline, that they need an answer Wait, this, you know, at the next meeting. Right? Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think spending some time to, to, yeah. to craft that recommendation yeah. wise. For right. sure. did, did they not know coming in about that statement that you just read? Because it seems like they might not have come before us, had they? Because it kind of concluded. Yeah, I haven't asked them, Leroy, but I suspect they didn't. I, I just stumbled on it yesterday myself. Uh, it had not occurred to me. So, um, no, I don't believe they did. I didn't. I had forgotten all about that. That was in that so there you go yeah. i mean what better yeah, use me for this money than something like this but i just don't you know we don't need to be opening any pandora's boxes either with folks you know one other option i want to speak for crossroads the, the owner the one who has the ultimate responsibility of 10 percent um perhaps they could be approached and if they agree to not count these 51 toward their 10 percent requirement um, again, I've not approached the issue with them. They probably <laughs> won't like that idea. Uh, but, yeah. 
No, so, so. Do, do you know how many affordable units they have all done so? I don't off the top of my head, but my mm -hmm. recollection when they checked in with us in late August, uh, it was nearly 20% of all units built already. Already. And well, and it, yes. What is the percentage of completion on the block? Uh, there are 500 units of 2,000, so they're about 25% complete. So there's there's a lot of runtime left. Yeah. Tom, when you say the uh, units they built are affordable, are they built to stay affordable? Or they were just met affordable on the first run, and now when they get resold, that's it. They're not affordable anymore. No, these are deed restricted. These are absolutely okay. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, practically affordable. The number is approaching sixty percent. Um, yeah. At least for workforce, it's not. Yeah, workforce. I was going to say that's workforce. That's not affordable. <clears throat> affordable. So, is there a way to parcel that out with the downs? Right. Would that even be a legitimate deal to do to say to them, you guys do not want to count this for sure? Well, I think the reason the uh, past council put this restriction in that you can't use these funds uh, if you're required to do this makes sense on its face. So, to the extent <clears throat> a commitment like that from the downs um, speaks directly to that issue, that we're still going to honor the underlying requirement. Again, I don't want to speak for them at all. But, uh, uh, Following yeah, I was I was thinking that you know if uh, it didn't want you know if there's a you know one of these in loop fee areas that I just, they didn't want to use that money to and, you know build you know, what you have to build you know <coughs> have a in law uh, in, uh, in lieu option where right. they must actually provide units. So why don't they put up a few hundred thousand? <laughs> now see that's that's no, what no. I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 they could. <laughs> and I raised the CEA not to confuse the issue, but you know, there's two different asks going right. on council, yeah, right, and, right. and I think they'll get equal equally screwed down. I, I, I think it's really important that they're asking for much less than they normally would. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's because it's strictly economic. I mean to and normally a, a project like this would come in at 75 or 50 percent and um you know I, I always appreciate when people ask for what they need rather than what they can get yeah. you know and yeah. um i think oh, when a lot of people go into new communities and, and say oh well what's you know what's normal around here yeah uh, say oh well, you, people usually get 50 percent nobody blinks um and yeah so that's what you ask for at least um but what I what I heard tonight was oh well all we need is twenty five percent so that's what we're asking for true but what that will require I think with this council is them to walk us through the proposal show us yeah. demonstrate why we need it and what does it look like with whereas with, with, uh, what's been successful in the past is the council understanding that these three points to get me the the big money yeah right. is really what I'm looking for yeah. so, you know it helps the bottom line but it's really about being competitive mm -hmm. and getting yeah. funding yeah so there's just a little a little more work. It's a different, different kind of work. Yes. It's smart for them to wait until the GMO gets on. Yeah, Paul actually uh, provided comment in some of the final meetings. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I, I think of this as a staple, kind of. I mean, the fact that they already had other talent working for them. I mean, it's something that could really stick up set Scarborough aside that you have this whole dedicated building for just this. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I mean, they've even got repair facilities in the facility to take care yeah. of people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, it seems like a well thought out idea. Yeah. It, you know, they didn't mention it, but you know, there, there seems to also be kind of a potential nice like nexus between it and main veterans homes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine yeah, some of the people living there, you know, are probably Fully vets that were you know, injured and um, would love to be out of home, yeah, in a good situation yeah. like that, yeah. Uh, or maybe someday they end up moving to, yeah, you know, home, right. So it's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty cool opportunity. Incidentally, we have a current balance of about $656,000 in this account, so there's certainly sufficient funds. That was going to be my next question, yeah. and uh, we just paid out the final one that had been authorized for the investor project at the old firehouse, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a good project, yeah. right? And, and with Jean Marie, I mean, this, this, there's big need for this. And, yes. And 
I don't understand everything you guys are talking about, but it seems to me it's just a technical issue and that most people would be on board to try to see yeah. that this gets done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? It sounds like there's general interest. We're not yeah. asking for a vote. So, so, let, so we yeah. can spend some time to draft a recommendation for your consideration at the next meeting. Yeah. I think you're Talk. too Talk. asking about the income because I don't think they're I don't think they're looking for the people that are not watching. It seemed like it yeah. seemed like they're looking for the people that are looking to have a lifestyle and be part of the workforce as <clears> right. opposed to someone that's just on welfare yeah. or something. So, yeah. Eric. Hey Tom, remind me, did the the Uplands projects that Kevin built have a CEA? No. So what's your what's your sense on that? Oh, yeah. Good question. Yeah, I mean, we've already committed 40% of all <coughs> uh, to Crossroads. So this 25% would be 65 effectively for that project. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I personally, I, I tend to agree that it's such a unique project that, that um, it's a unicorn. And it would be great to be uh, a part of that and have it in our community. Mm -hmm. So that might carry the day. I'd like to think it does. Mm -hmm. In a real strong partnership between 3i and and uh Corey's team mm -hmm. and poa has a stellar reputation uh, which is Corey's team and, uh, and everything yes. i do about paul is just uh, really top top notch uh, yeah. i've heard from a couple of people i think you put this any other place and we don't have a discussion about it to be honest mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're right yeah it would be interesting to see who would have enough nerve to really push politically a, a no position on something like this? You know, it's like, <coughs> that would that'd be like, you know. Let's write the names on a napkin, Jim. Yeah. Uh, well, I know, I can <laughs> guess already. But, but that being, that being <coughs> said, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, my God, if you come out no against this, then what are you for? I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> Swimming pool. I'll stop. <laughs> I'll run the group that we're recorded right now. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But... Uh, I haven't seen part of what they're, they'll have to go through a full application of the CDA, and part of that will uh, anticipate um, value and, and do a full projection of the tax it paid. Return. So I, I don't know. So they've got projected taxes at eighty six thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, they actually did quite that. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, same time, but um, <laughs> but they'll be required to actually do a projection. I don't know if that's a funded number or that's in taxes in year one, but uh, they'll be required to do a full blown performance over the term of the CA or the twenty or thirty years. Um, and that accounts for future tax rates and increases and decreases in value mm -hmm. and projects that out over time. But that's a, you know, take your number 25% of it. Yeah, it's 86, so I mean, that's 25,000 a year. Yeah, I mean, the other consideration you, you, is, is to understand the residents and what, resi what the residents will be seeking in terms of service provision from us. Well, right. that's in part one of the I'm just anticipating a question around school age kids. Um, expecting, I hope there will be some uh, families living here. Mm, right. Uh, the housing the facility is going to be quite self sufficient. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised, though, that there's um, adults, <clears throat> you know, adults living with, right, with their adult parents, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in the buildings. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I I saw a lot of that. Now, granted, this was thirty years ago, but yeah, you would have um, adult. <laughs> they're usually males, regretfully, with TBI, traumatic brain injury, or or something like that. And they would they'd be living with their families, meaning mm. their you know parents or a mother or father or or whatever, and maybe siblings. Um, and and I can see that you may get that situation where some of these units 
may be used that way, but to me, that's what it's for. Mm. Because those people, if you, uh, if you could have seen the situation some of these people were in, and as, as the gentleman said, you know, it's a blink of an eye, it's a motorcycle accident, it's, uh, it's you know, falling down the stairs, it's, it's whatever. Uh, and then people's lives change and it's not just them, it's everyone else connected with them. So, yeah. Um, you're only talking 20 units. So, you know, even if you fill those, you're, you know, with kids, you're talking maybe 20 right. kids. Yeah. Right. Not a lot. You know? Yeah. 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 And, 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 yeah. 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 I, I, I suspect it could be co-living too. I mean, yes. The show on Prime called As We See It that has three autistic adults living together sort of in a three-bedroom apartment that yes. I imagine this could be that situation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same token too. You could have a, a kid that's disabled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Part of the school yeah. system as well. Yeah. So disabled, it will, or, I mean, I was thinking physically disabled just in the presentation, but I suspect mm -hmm. will be. Well, that, that's going to be kind of an interesting question is, you know, when somebody comes up and, yeah, you know, listen, you're not disabled enough. I mean, yeah, that's. I thought I heard. Yeah, but that, well, that's but that's yeah, like, right. yeah, yeah. So it's like. But that's of, like TBI. I mean, there are people out there with traumatic brain injury, and if you okay. met them, you wouldn't yeah. know. You'd look at them, but then you realize, whoa, there's something missing here. Yeah. So yeah. Um, don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, great. This this is a great project. So this will be back on our next uh, agenda, and we will uh, talk more formally about it. Yep. Um, and thank you guys. That was terrific. Um, it's getting late, so I want to be respectful of people's time. Um, but I do want to breeze through a couple of things, skip at least one thing, <coughs> and kind of move along. Um, I'm going to go out of order just for the sake of time, uh, and go towards the end and just mention that there is a uh, main housing housing policy conference coming up um, that I think, did we send the information on that? The, the link is on the agenda. Oh, Keep it. well, yeah, my, my agenda is links don't work. Um, I don't know if everybody else is doing it, but, um, but yeah, so there's, there is a main housing policy conference interested in. Um, Apparently, I'll forward the I'll forward the email to all of you before I leave tonight. Right. Okay. Where is it? Good question. <laughs> uh, it's in the Western Portland Western Portland Harbor View Hotel on High Street on the seventeenth of November. Let me see if anybody's interested in going. Yeah, if you're interested in going, um, I'm I'm signed up. Um, yeah, I might be. It's uh it's 150 bucks, but I think I don't know if the town will be able to. Cover the uh, esteemed members of the Housing Alliance to yeah, learn more about housing place. Somehow, probably in Florida. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll circulate that. When is it? I'm sorry. November seventh, November seventh. At what time? I think it's all day. It must be a Saturday, right? Uh, no, it's not. No. It's, it's, I'll tell you what. It's an all day. It's an all day it's conference a, put out by a combination of the. Main Affordable Housing Coalition and Main State Housing Authority. Oh, I'd be interested in that potentially. Yeah, it's like it's I've got down from eight to three on my calendar. Yeah, eight to four. In November 17th, eight to four. There's like an awards portion and interviews and key speakers. And yeah. So I'll circulate that. Anyone interested, <laughs> get back to me sooner than later and we'll see. I would be. <laughs> maybe we can use the uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we could put in a request to our uh, affordable housing trust fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to skip the idea of a SEDCO housing alliance conference, um, sort of. Uh, but I will mention I had a, a good long conversation with Karen Martin from SEDCO, and we were talking about all things housing and a lot of things SEDCO, and she. Uh, and we kind of had this idea that yeah, there's a lot of housing stuff going on. Um, and wouldn't it be great to get together and talk about it? Uh, but then this email came out and it turns out main housing thinks the same thing. So we said maybe we should just piggyback on that rather than organizing our own conference. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, there's a lot of relevant local things. You know, 
So that's what that item was about. Um, <clears throat> the item before that on the agenda, though, has to do with interest rates. Um, and uh, I don't know uh, how much people have been paying attention, but interest rates are going up and up and up. Um, just the borrowing rates. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're, yeah, they're both. <laughs> yeah, the savings ones are <laughs> going out, right? They're about 7% right now for uh, buyers, my buyers. And, wow. and it's crazy. Um, and you know, we, we weren't saying this 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> the prices were a lot lower yeah. 15 well, years ago. Too, so. Yeah, that's right. I don't think they're going to bring back to 15 years ago. We, yeah. No. One of, the, one of the things that we think about affordability uh, is you know, the cost of housing and a lot of the cost of housing is mortgage payments. And uh, we've got these lovely spreadsheets that we use to determine if uh, housing costs are affordable. Uh, and in some of the past versions of these lovely spreadsheets, uh, the interest rates we've been using are like four and four and a half percent. And we were using those interest rates when like you know, everybody around this table was getting interest rates so of three and three and a half percent. And we said, oh, well, you know, let's, uh, let's add a little buffer and include a four and a half percent interest rate. Um, but now that interest rates for everybody are like six and seven percent, um, it just strikes me that one, we ought to change the rates in those spreadsheets. Um, two, we ought to have a discussion, maybe not tonight, but some point soon, about how to, you know, how and when and how often to um, update those things and um, you know, how to give guidance to developers who are trying to build affordably here um, and, and just you know, what it all means. <clears throat> It's, uh, but that's it, those are this rise in interest rates has taken a whole bunch of buyers out of the market, right? Yeah, they just simply aren't even in the game anymore. Uh, probably. Well, it's also taken a number of sellers out of the market because I now have sellers, you know, older folks like me who are considering mm -hmm. downsizing. But now they're like, whoa, wait a minute, I've got a 3% mortgage. And if I buy something, I'm going to have to go to seven. Uh, I think I'll stay put. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like we should have gotten interest rates. It's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. What's I mean, the problem? Yeah, I don't know. And, and like, where, what should our... Uh, what should we peg it for? Peg it to? Is there a would you is there an index or something? And yeah, you know, is there some published number that we could go to reliably? Um, you know, if, if there was, if we were a credit card, which we're not, we would peg ourselves to you know, time rate plus something. Um, we got to have a really yeah. Name. What is it? It's it's I forget what year. Bond plus two is what. Probably some Freddie Mac index or something. You know. Or, I uh, forget. Is it the ten year bond plus two? I don't know. A lender would know. A lender's would know. So yeah, so it's 4.49. You add two, there's your 6.49. Yeah. But interest rates are different for different maturities, right? And for different, uh, and right? For different, but, you know, borrowers. The price. average, the average person's borrowing 30 year. Most people do 30 year mortgages. It's been my experience over 20 years in the business. So what Brian's referring to is, is spreadsheets that attempt to approximate someone's, you know, the affordability. Right. Right? And so there's right. a, a number of assumptions baked into that. Interest rate being one thing. <coughs> and, uh, and so and so forth. I mean, if you look at any 15, your 30, you know, we've had it, we did it in 2.65 and 3, but some of the 15s were even lower than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you go to 6.49, you should equate to the 15s and the 30s. Mm -hmm. so you give yourself a little bit of buffer on the 15s, but maybe not a question. Yeah. There's still a lot of a little bit of buffer, like you were talking about. Right. It's a little, yeah. a little extra. I think it is important to put it in historical context. I mean, will correct me, but the historical average interest rate is. Something in the six range. Mm -hmm. No, at it's least. eight. It's eight percent. Jeez, at least. Yeah. Good, man. That's a lot. That's a lot so of. Oh, I bought. I bought my first. Now, yeah. Yeah. I, I bought my first there. house in 1982. That's that's how that old that. I am, guys. Okay. Eighteen <laughs> percent was the rate. If you get the loan. If you can get the loan, and I got the very yeah. first main state housing that was issued. Was in 1982, and I got a buy down down 
I want to say 14% or something like that. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, my, rate, my rate was 14%, but then again, I paid what you pay for a truck now. Yeah. <laughs> is that discussion yeah. or do you just want a discussion on it or a recommendation well i don't know i mean that seems like something we could do now yeah it, it, does does somebody one have an interest in this and two have you know a relationship with a lender who might be able you know, could reach out to a lender to see like what we could peg this to um so that you know if every month well, yeah. or, or at every meeting we could update our current number or every well, song, I know I know we, you, we you could know. say you know the the whatever it is yeah the yeah whatever yeah the Eric index is five percent this month um so our our number is five percent um that'd be great I use I use Kim Kim Sawyer Mike Sawyer's wife she she's here in Scar you guys may know her her, her daughters anyway um she's the lender i use um she's been around forever fine what i think you're suggesting is we come up with a kind of a tenant to an index on the yeah like that. yeah so yeah. we so don't some, have to have some a some published it is what i'm asking for. so um i think the question for kim is what's uh what's the what's an accepted published okay. index for for mortgage interest rates. All right, I'll ask her. I'll ask her. Leroy's, Leroy's going to ask her, Jean Marie. Oh, okay. Yeah, Leroy's going to reach out. Uh, uh, public what? Uh, published. 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 Uh, yeah, the index. published index. For, yeah. Mortgage interest rates. Secondary market rates, basically. Index for mortgage rates. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe just explain to her that we're we're trying to have something that we can consistently look yeah. to. Yeah. 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 Exactly. We're looking for a national level or a regional level. I think something that a borrower here would yeah, we could rely on. Regional. Regional. Yeah. It's a it's a national figure. It's a federally yeah. accepted figure that they would use. Yeah. Mark. Mar Did you mention Mark Maroon too? Mark would know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Mark would know. That'd be great. Yeah, Mark would know. Um. Like and then, at, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think when you come back with that, then we can have a conversation about implementation and like how often we'd want to update it and, and kind of the mechanism for that. And um, I think that'd be great that we, we could really have a, <clears throat> a useful tool for people. Because um, at some point soon, somebody is going to build something because they have to. Um, and they're going to say, How much can I charge for this? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, one, I want to be helpful to people, but two, I don't want to be caught flat footed. Right. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Um, right. we, we, don't, we, don't, and we don't know. We don't have those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, uh, 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 Lori Warshall. Uh, Lori, Lori Warshall at Bitterford Savings yeah. is somebody yeah. who works closely with the uh, Scarborough Library. Uh, and so she's public spirited and would be happy to help if uh, if you run into problems getting it in another source she'd be right. she'd be a good alternative yep she is she is another I mean we we know a ton of people or I do so anyway we'll get it for you we'll get it for you Brian um then the last item which was the third item but not the last one um is uh, I've been playing around with data and graphs. Uh-oh. Oh, <laughs> out a little You're bit. a data guy. Data guy, watch out. <laughs> um, full disclosure. Um, so Karen sent Tom and I, Tom and me uh, this really cool data set of incomes by uh, occupation for like, I didn't the local area. It was super cool. <laughs> really? um, and I said, oh my God, this is great. <clears throat> because then I thought about how some people like in the town, don't quite understand the value of affordable housing. Um, and I said, wow, imagine if, and so then I was like doom scrolling on Instagram and I saw this really cool chart from Silvio Foley that said, oh wow, there's this many houses for sale at this price, and this many at this price, and this many at this price. Uh, so I reached out to Michaela and I said, hey, can you give me the data behind this cool thing? All right. And put them together and created that chart or that you know, that tool, which kind of allows you to see, you know, what's for sale right now 
in Scarborough through kind of a dot plot. Um, and then you can like futz around with like, you know, a one or two income earning household and see like what that household could afford. Uh, pretty soon you see like, wow, you know, with what's for sale in town right now, you know, even before like maybe crazy interest rates, you can't, you know, people with like normal jobs can't afford. They can't. Um, and so one, I wanted to share that with you guys. Two, I, I'd like to further develop it um, if you guys are interested um, and, and share it with people as kind of an educational, uh, particularly with some town counselors uh, to help them you know, really appreciate the, you know, the work we're doing, the work that people do who develop affordable housing. Um, because I, I think, well, I, I think when people hear the phrase affordable housing, it creates an image in their head. Um, and I think when we work with affordable housing as a concept, um, I think we have a different image. Um, and so like when the, when the butcher and the baker for a house in Scarborough, I, you know, that's too bad. Like that's not, yeah, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, the, the sales on that are, you can, you can adjust. Mm -hmm. right? Like we talked about the interest rate. Yep. Or you can put in just whatever the salary is. You don't have to find some. Yes, in. that's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jean Marie, I'm sure when you get uh, an audience with the council, they, they've been quite receptive to having workshops with various committees just to, kind yes. of, to have a better understanding of what the committees are up to. Yeah. Uh, that kind of, that, that's something I could work on getting scheduled. I'll also mention, though, the council took action a couple of weeks ago to get, it was really a band aid approach to get through the, the GMO discussion with the Dow. Right. Uh, that is lurking under the surface. Um, and we've already begun conversations around what they characterize as a much more comprehensive review and modification to that whole ordinance. And part of that discussion will include whether affordable um, units uh, are required to get both permits or they're exempt from them. So I bring that up by saying, I think getting an audience with council to kind of start right. to lay some of the groundwork uh, over the you know, late fall, early spring would be very wise before they start to have that GMO discussion. Oh, great. Okay. I agree. I agree. I agree too. So let's uh, let the council reorganize itself. I'll figure out who the new leadership is, but I'll put a note that that will be a future um, workshop topic. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. In the living or play law, you can see a percentage of affordable housing down there next to the roof. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Uh huh. What are you saying? Yeah. So uh, I've got carpenter, uh, a household of carpenter and interior designer, uh, and of the forty-eight properties on the market, um, nine would be affordable for this hypothetical. Okay. I don't have I don't have the same excitement level as you do on it, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't study it by it. So for the different uh, occupations, there's an average salary or some sort of yeah, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. medium, it's medium salary. Medium salary. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, I agree. <laughs> you didn't geek out on it. Yeah, so. medium, medium. <laughs> no. I can't believe I can't believe. I thought it was a double. Double. I can't believe you couldn't find a candlestick maker. No, oh, there's no candlestick maker. I'm sure you can make one out. <laughs> I might. <laughs> Don't Yankee candle. Yeah, we had a. Oh, there you go. In town. Yeah, that was funny. Arthur <laughs> Dillon, he uh, very proudly good. held the title of master candy maker. Yeah, that's all. Master candy maker. So that's all that's on the agenda. Anything else that anybody wants to talk about, uh, Eric or Eric? No, I think I'm going to move for adjournment. Uh, oh, have a drink. All right. <laughs> <laughs> just for next agenda, Brian, just real quick. So yeah. I expect we'll have um, some thoughts about a recommendation on the three eyed project we discussed earlier. Yep. Uh, Leroy, you can report back on, or we can have a discussion on this interest rate. Yeah, I'll get that to you. Great. Okay. And then, Brian, uh, Dan Bacon had reached out to you and I, and I think Eric. Um, in September, just saying, hey, we've got a lot of stuff going on. We'd love to, you know, we'd love to come check in with you guys. So, yeah, uh, doesn't have to be next meeting, but yeah, let, let's uh, let's 
have him over maybe the meeting after that. Let, let's also talk about the date of the next meeting now, if we can. Um, the date for the next meeting is currently scheduled for Wednesday, November 23rd, which is the night before Thanksgiving. Yeah, oh, so that's I, great. I don't think that's a yeah, great I don't think that's to have a meeting. Um, if uh, I'm having it for the week after, yeah, you want to meet the 30th? Does that work for people? I think that would be much better. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm gonna be away. On Zoom. I will be yeah, away in Florida. <laughs> Oh, I've got, yeah. I got a committee meeting. Oh, dear. I missed the date. What yeah. was the date you said? Uh, I was proposing the 30th. That works for me, but. Actually, I got nothing. You got nothing? Yeah. All right. Would you like so to join us? Be away. Would you like to join? Sure. Bill, would you be able to join by Zoom? No, I'll be visiting my uh, granddaughter on the West Coast. So oh, right. I'll be. I'll be fully engaged. All right. Well, if you get sick of her, uh, that's about happy hour. Right. <laughs> 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 Kevin and Dan, it might be a good follow up to this meeting we just had, yeah. too. Yeah. Because we can address some of these things that we were talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, they just reach out. Yeah, why don't we have them come? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good idea. Same time, sick. Same that time, same that place. Now you're dating yourself. <laughs> uh, great. So, uh, yeah, right. uh, well, good. We have a motion to adjourn. We've got a date for the meeting. And uh, that's about it. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everyone.